In this video, I'm going to demonstrate two very easy, simple ways that you can do some baking while you're on the trail. If you're interested, keep watching. But first, I got to get some bug stuff on. The mosquitoes are killing me. All right, before we get started, I just want to share with you, with you where the idea for this video came from. So there was a post recently on a new Facebook group known as Twig Stove Aficiendos, and the poster was asking about baking. Had anybody done any baking with their twig stove? And I shared a little bit of what I have done in the past, but I thought, what a great idea for a video. So that's where it came from. So with this video, we're going to be covering some very, very simple methods of baking while you're on the trail, um, usually with things you probably already already have with you. It is going to be limited to working with a twig stove, although it could be done with an open fire. It could also be done with an alcohol stove if you have the fuel capacity and with a butane stove as well. But let me tell you what it's not going to get into. So to start with, it's not going to get into Dutch oven cooking. That's just a little bit too much for me to carry into the woods for doing a video at this point. If there's interest, maybe I can do some of that um, when I go car camping this summer, but no, I can't carry that into the wood. We're also not going to do everything that Steve Despain does with the firebox stove. I mean, Steve has mastered cooking or baking over the firebox stove using modified zebra billy cans, usually a 14 or a 16 centimeter uh, zebra billy can. And I, I'm not going to repeat all those things because he does such a good job of it. I'm also not going to cover all the more bushcrafty natural ways of baking, whether it's bannock wrapped around a stick, bannock on a plank, bannock on a rock, bannock right in the coals. You get the idea. We're not going to cover the very basics in terms of the very natural ways of cooking. What we are going to cover is two very simple methods that utilize things you likely already have with you in your pack when you go into the woods. So what are they? Well, for one is my pot. Where is it? So. With all the pots that I own, the one I carry most often is still my 12 centimeter zebra. You, I, you just can't kill this thing, and it's been used a lot. And it's going to work perfectly for this. Not like this, like Steve does, but straight up and down. I'll explain in a minute. So that I usually have, that's big enough. You can, in fact, you can get away with something smaller than 12 centimeters, but you're going to be limited to what you can bake in it. By the way, what we're baking today are going to be a muffin mix. Now this one is going to be my own ketogenic muffin mix, but it could be just as easily done with some store-bought muffin mixes. And I'll share with you a few simple hacks for that in a minute. We're not getting into baking roasts or anything like that. You could also do bannock. Certainly bannock will work well in this, but nothing more fancy than that. Uh, what else do you, you need? Inside of that pot, you're going to need some type of a vessel to hold whatever it is you're baking. So in this case, I'm going to be using my GSI Glacier mug. Um, also, I brought out my Sea to Summit a collapsible silicone mug because I'm going to show you two different styles and I just want, I could just easily have done it both with this. Uh, I'm not so sure both with this, but I'll explain what I mean in a minute. So those are the only really the things you need to have. It helps to have, well not helps, it's necessary to have some type of a spacer in the bottom of your pot. And that's it really. That's all that you really need in addition to your cup and your pot is a spacer. And a spacer is just something that keeps your cooked materials, your, in this case the muffin, from getting burnt on the bottom because of direct contact with the bottom of the pot, which of course is in direct contact with the heat. Something in between the two. Now I'm going to share with you a couple very simple ways of doing it and I'll show you what I brought out. So the most simple one, if you weren't planning on doing this but you decided you'd like to, is look around and see if you can find some small pebbles, some small rocks. They Just three or four at the same size, just enough to lift your cup off of the bottom of the pot. doesn't have to be very high. I have seen some fancy ideas of using uh, carbon felt cut to the size of your cup or whatever it is you're going to be using and that is an insulator between the bottom of the pot will work but that gets into some specialized materials that you may or may not have. You could use if you have some aluminum foil in your kit you could roll some of that up and drop some of those in as balls. I suppose you could use green sticks just a couple of small green sticks and I say green because it's going to be uh, quite a bit of heat in the bottom of that pot and you don't want a whole lot of smoke and certainly you don't want them to combust. So two other things and I think these are the easiest ones for most people to obtain and use for that matter are canning lid rings. So if you're doing any home canning and uh, you're, you know what these are, that's the larger one and that's the smaller one. These are perfect for dropping into the bottom of my pot 
to hold my cup off of the bottom. Now, the one I did make up for myself some time ago when I was doing some baking with the dog bowls, and uh, there is a video on baking with dog bowls if you're interested. I took a computer fan guard, they're called a computer fan guard, and you can see the little holes or eyelets where the screws would hold it against the side of the computer. I bent them under, and this just happens to be the perfect size for dropping down inside, hopefully you can see that, dropping down inside of my 12 centimeter zebra. So it will work for this baking. And you know what, it can sit in there and not take up any really any extra space for all the things that I usually carry in there. But those are the three simplest ones to use. Oh, I said I would show you some tricks and tips on baking. Okay, so maybe you don't want to spend a lot of money or you don't know what recipe you're going to use and you want to give this a try, uh, head over to your dollar store. Now, our dollar store in this area is Dollarama and they have these mixes available uh, for a dollar and that is, well, how about a chocolate chip? Betty Crocker chocolate chip. All you need is add water and you can get some pretty good sized muffins out of that. Or you could use uh, the Bisquicks, also from Betty Crocker, also a dollar at the dollar store, the Dollarama here in Halifax. And these are, again, just add water. No milk, no oil, no fats, no butter, no nothing. It's just add water, which makes them super simple and super cheap. And by the way, just another little hack. If you want, you can turn this into a bannock just as easily. Just go a little less water and mix it up a little bit more thoroughly than you would if you're making tea biscuits, which is this, that's what it is, is a tea biscuit mix. You could also use this to make pancakes just as easily if you brought your pan. Just mix it a little thinner than it would call for, and then you can use it for pancakes. You know, you can make chocolate chip pancakes out of this one, the same deal. So these are quite versatile and, you know, good to have for a dollar. You can transfer them into a Ziploc bag if you're not, you don't think you're going to use the whole thing. Just make sure you have the directions that you know exactly how much water to use. Now, my recipe I'll explain as I put it together. It's going to be a little different because it's another one of those ketogenic recipes that I come up with, which is a full meal deal. And it's if you're interested, of course, I'll share that recipe with you. Okay, so it looks as if I have some, uh, my coals are pretty close to ready. Now, I said I had two methods of cooking, baking, and the simplest one, and almost foolproof one, is called wet baking. And in wet baking, it's exactly what it sounds like. You start by mixing up whatever it is you want to cook, put it in your cup, either the silicone one or the metal one, put some water in the bottom of your pot, set your cup down inside, put the lid on, put it over your heat source. You don't even need a spacer for this. You can get away without a spacer because the water will keep it from burning on the bottom. Now, what are the advantages? You almost cannot overcook your muffin. It's amazing. It keeps the temperature very regulated and just high enough to cook the muffin and uh, comes out quite nice. The downside is it doesn't brown. You usually don't get a nice crusty brown top of your muffin. But it's not wet and sticky like you might think it is. It just comes out like a regular muffin, just a little whiter on top. So I'll share that one with you. And then the second method we're going to follow up with is the dry baking. Same thing exactly. I'll use my metal cup for this rather than the silicone cup. I will put the spacer in. This is where the spacer is vital. It'll be exactly the same recipe, the exact same mount, and we'll bake the two of them. And I'll show you how to test for whether they're done as we go along. Okay, let me get set up, and I'll put my mix together. I'll show you doing that. I'll get it into the can with the water, and we'll watch it bake. Well, not the whole thing, of course, but we'll watch it start baking anyway. All right, hopefully you can see everything that I'm doing here. I'm working with the sun and the wind as usual. So let's see, let's get started. So this is also a Sea to Summit bowl that I've had for some years. It was one that my daughter gave me as a Christmas present probably 10 years ago now, part of a set. And uh, so this is what I'm going to use to mix my stuff in. So the mixture I have, I'll give you the full recipe in the uh, show notes if you're interested, but this is going to be a savory muffin or savory biscuit. There's no sweetener in this whatsoever. The primary component is almond flour and uh, baking powder and spices, a lot of spices. And well, the rest of the stuff I'll put in there. Uh, you can see it because again, this is kind of like a huge breakfast muffin. So I'm just going to put half of that in to start. Because, of course, I'm going to be making two muffins. If I can do this with reasonable measurements. Yeah, I think I got it. 
All right, so there's my mix. Now, the first thing that I am mixing, now, mine is not an instant mix by any means. It requires uh, quite a few ingredients, as you'll see. I'm going to be using, putting some oil in, and my oil is ghee. I like ghee, it's, which is basically butter. And no, I'm not measuring what I'm doing. I'm just kind of going by eye. This is probably a tablespoon and a half, two tablespoons at the most. And mix it in. You know, if you were making a bannock or tea biscuits at home, you would be using shortening or butter or something. You can use oil, of course. Just do your best job of mixing it through to kind of distribute it around inside of the material. You know, it's hard as baking sometimes appears when you see the real professionals doing it. My experience is, and I'm certainly anything but a professional, is it makes, I think it's made to look too hard. This is much easier than you might think it is. All right, I've got a little bit of a well in the center there. Push off some of the stuff that I was on my spoon. Uh, mine, again, rich. Gonna be a rich, rich meal. Next comes an egg. Eggs are great. Not something you're gonna be taking everywhere with you. And not necessary if you're using one of those pre-mixed meals, but let's mix an egg in now. All right. Getting pretty thick. And next I'm gonna be mixing in some cheese, yes. Cheddar cheese that I grated up before coming out this morning, which is now a little hot and sloppy. <laughs> but, yeah, that should do it. Close that up and eat the rest of it for the second muffin. And, secret ingredient. Makes life easy. I would love to say that I made these bacon, or cooked up some bacon out here, but I took a, a cheater's way and I went to the store and got some real bacon mix. These aren't the fake ones. These are real bacon, as you can see. And, I don't know, what have I got there? Handful, mixed in as well. So you can see what makes this a full meal deal besides the, the muff, the mix itself. I have uh, cheese and bacon and egg. Sounds pretty rich, doesn't it? Well, you know what, I think that's gonna need a little bit of water. Now, where's my water? All right, this is where you have to be a little careful. This is why I always say if you're making bannock or anything else is that you hold back uh, a little bit of the dry materials because a little bit of water at a time, what was that, a tablespoon or so, can go a long ways. But I probably have to add a little bit more yet before we... Yeah, a little bit more. If this got a little bit sloppy, I mean, I'm not making a bannock. If this got a little bit sloppy, no big deal. In fact, you want it to look kind of like a muffin mix, which is quite wet. That's pretty close, right? I think I may just put another drop in. Man, I can smell, oh yeah, there's quite a bit of garlic in this, by the way. All right, that's more than enough, I'm sure. So while um, I was preparing this, I have my Zebra Billy can sitting on top of the firebox stove. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Heating the water up because you want the water to come to a boil to start, especially if you're using lake water, I guess. Now, you're not consuming any of this water, but uh, you want it to heat. Now, at the same time, when you cook, you're going to be using a medium to medium high heat, not nothing too high. This is where experience kicks in and you have to kind of judge. You don't want it to get too hot. It's, this is, it's probably more important during the dry baking than it is during the wet baking, but again, no sense in having it too hot. Now, I will show you how much water I put in. Probably an inch of water, and it's just come to a boil, which is great. Probably about an inch of water in there. Uh, you want to simmer it for the length of time that you're doing the baking. So uh, I'm going to transfer this now into the silicone mug. But before I do, I'm going to take a little bit of vegetable oil or olive oil and just kind of wipe the inside of it with my finger. And that will help with the release at the end of the baking. You know, with silicone, you probably don't need to do it. It's just a good practice to get into. It makes it a little easier to get the muffin out at the end. All right, give me a second to do that.
So I'm just wiping the oil around the inside. Yeah, that's nice. All right, let's get that muffin mix into the cup. And one of the downsides of these cups is the fact they're narrow at the bottom. You have to be really careful you don't dump your contents. Okay, that looks pretty good. All right, I'm going to reposition the camera so you can see me dropping this into the pot. All right, the water is boiling here. It might be hotter than expected. The firebox does such a great job with charcoal. Uh, sometimes a little hard to get out there. Let's see if that works better. Uh, so, all right, so good. It's not boiling too hard. That's just what I want it. And as you can see, there's my muffin ready to go. And all I'm going to do is literally drop that right into the water. And it looks like it's just started to float on top of the water. And that's about perfect. Now, all that's left to do now is wait. It, my experience, 10 to 15 minutes. 15 at the most, it's probably be done. If you happen to let it go 20, it probably still be just fine. Only thing you want to do maybe is take the lid off once or twice to make sure you haven't run out of water. Okay, when it looks like it's done, I'll bring it back. All right, so the first muffin is, is in the Zebra Billet can and it's the wet, wet bake muffin and it's going well. Uh, I'm watching it closely to make sure that as long as there's steam coming out of the pot, I don't, I, I'm not concerned that I'm running out of water, but I will keep an eye on it just to make sure I don't run out of water because that would not be a good thing to do. All right, so I am going to work on the second muffin and have it prepared and all ready to go. So once the first one is ready, I'll be able to empty the pot out of water drop in my spacer, drop in my metal cup, and go from there. But a couple things I just wanted to mention while we're waiting for that to happen. Uh, I didn't talk about this with the selection of the pot that you're going to be using. So yes, I'm using my 12 centimeter zebra pot, which is stainless steel, and I said it's bomb proof, and you know, I have no concerns putting this over any amount of heat empty and thinking about it melting or warping or anything else. Discolors, yeah, it does, but uh, that's not a problem for me. Um, can you do this with titanium? Yes, you can. Can you do this with aluminum? Yes, you can with a few cautions. My caution would be uh, use a thicker aluminum pot if you have it. Anodized aluminum will work well. I'm talking about dry baking because wet baking you can do with anything, just about any pot whatsoever. An anodized aluminum pot will work for dry baking and so will a regular aluminum pot as long as you are careful with the heat. So heat management is critical for this. Don't let it get too hot. It doesn't need to to bake. It doesn't have to get all that hot. You want it kind of a low. So no roaring flames if you're using an open fire. Get down to coals and you should have good control over the heat and you'll be able to use it. Okay, so I am using the stainless steel uh, glacier mug for the dry bake because I know it will stand the heat. I'm not confident in the silicone. It should. It's rated for the heat, but I, I wanted to show that you could use both cups anyway. Now, in the first one of the silicone, whether I had to or not, I lined or rubbed the inside of the silicone with some olive oil just so that muffin wouldn't stick. Silicone, it probably wasn't necessary to do it. It's just a good practice. I think I said that already to get into. I'm going to do the same thing with the glacier mug, but I just wanted to point out a couple of alternatives. You can get silicone muffin liners, I guess. They look like the paper ones and drop those in if you want to use those to to uh, put your everything in. If you want to take those extra things along, I'm trying to keep it simple here. But one that takes up really no space, works very well, is parchment paper. Parchment paper is a non-stick baking paper intended just for this purpose. Most people put it on pans for cookies or and the like, but you could cut a circle out, drop it in the bottom of your cup, cut a rectangle out the right size so that it sits on the um, you know covers up the walls and you'll have no problem getting your muffin out and it will help a little bit from it getting overly overcooked and browning too much. If you don't have either of those things and you do have some regular paper you can put some olive oil right on the paper and put it in and that'll do very much the same thing. Uh, yeah so those are my tricks for using or keeping things from sticking inside of a stainless steel mug if that's what you're going to use. All right, we have probably five more minutes and that give me just enough time for my second muffin to get that prepared and I'll bring it back when I think the first one is ready to bring out. All right, we are at, I think I left it a full 20 minutes. Like I said, I'm not too concerned when it comes to uh, using or doing wet baking, you know, for it to overcook. I've never really had that issue. So let's get this off. Now, it's going to look a little pale, as you can see. So it almost looks like it's not done because you're used to seeing things that are, you know, browned on top. So how do you test? 
toothpick or my improvised toothpick, shove it in the center. If it comes out dry and it does, then it is done. Now, the only thing I didn't mention that's probably helpful is some way of getting this out of the pot. And a little challenging, maybe. There. All right, so that one is out. I have to get rid of the water that's in the pot so that I can set it up for dry baking. Just give me one second, I'll do that, and we'll go on with the next uh, next set. Okay, I noticed while I was uh, taking the muffin out. So, th by the way, the muffin is just setting aside for a minute. It helps just to leave it set for maybe three, four minutes just to kind of set up firmly before you take it out of its tin. So I just uh, decided to put a few more pieces of charcoal in. Always good. So I dropped the spacer inside. And I am using the, fa the fan guard. It's just my preferred. I could have just easily used anything else. And, uh, yep, lots of heat is starting to steam what's left in terms of water. There's my muffin inside of my glacier mug. Let me get that down inside. Goes in nicely. Get the lid on. And this one I will check a little bit more diligently when it gets to be the 10 to 15 minute mark so that it doesn't burn. Okay, I'm going to give the, this one, here's the one that we just did, give this a minute or two to set up and uh, we'll take it out of the cup and see what it looks like. All right, the moment of truth. Here's my muffin and I have my bowl so I can put it in. Um, theoretically, I should be able to just turn this upside down and have it drop out like that. Okay, let me bring it up to you to show you what it looks like. <laughs> it smells amazing. And uh, then I'll break it open. So, Okay, so there it is, upside down in my bowl, fully cooked. Like you can see, it did not brown uh, like a something baked in an oven would, but I guarantee it's fully cooked. So I will back up here and I guess I don't have a small knife. I guess I'm using my bushcraft knife to cut this open. I probably don't even have to. I could probably do... Ooh, yeah. Just kind of fell out. Oh, yeah. Woo! And steamy. Once again, I'll show you. Okay, fully cooked. The bacon, the cheese, the egg, and all the... Lots of garlic in this one. All right. That's... You can see the steam coming off. That's why you don't have to be in a rush to take it out of its pot. Okay. So obviously it's a little, a little hotter than uh, I want to try eating with the way it is. So I'm just going to let it sit for a few minutes while the other one is baking away. It's had five minutes now. I got to give it another five or so before I check it. Uh, I'll bring it back. So I checked a few minutes ago just to see the progress, now 15 minutes into the bake, and uh, I noticed that the top of the muffin wasn't browning. So this is a trick I had forgotten to share with you, and I thought I'd share it with you now. It's probably too late to make a big difference in the muffin that I have inside, but uh, the Zebra Billy may flip the lid over, and it makes a great place to put a few hot coals on top. But uh, it's, uh, like I said, it's probably not going to be there long enough because I don't want the rest of the muffin to burn. Let's take that off. Oh, the wind is really picking up behind me. Hopefully you can hear what I'm saying. I'll check inside. Uh, it's not cooked. It's not cooked yet at all. All right, another few minutes. I think what happened was when I added the extra charcoal back on, it uh, slowed the baking process down. So I'm going to give it another five minutes or so. Dry baking like this, you would think it is hotter, that it's going to go faster, but in fact it's just the opposite. It can easily take 20 minutes to bake a muffin dry baking, depending on your heat source of course, because you're not getting all the heat contact that you do with the wet baking. So, you know, I really actually like wet baking a bit more, but uh, we'll give this another few more minutes and see if we can't bring it up to where it's, where it's cooked in the middle. Gave it a couple more minutes, about five more minutes. Let's see if I can get this off. You know, I do have a Coglin's pot grabber that is also good for doing this, but uh, it's easy to do with a multi-tool, so all together different. All right, here we go. And a little browned on top too. So now I just got to get this out somehow. Show it to you. Now I do need to let it set for a few minutes to cool off. And I think I'll use the rest of that heat. See if I can get this off of here. There we go. 
drop those hot coals back in that I had, I think I can probably get a cup of coffee out of this. Whew, what a beautiful day out here it is. About 22, 23 degrees, still breezy, but I'll take it, I'll take it. Okay, I've given it a few minutes to cool down and let's see if it's gonna drop out of its cup the same way the silicone one did. It's hot, surprise, or no surprise, I guess, so. I am using the glove for this. If it doesn't drop right out, then no worries. Let it set. I've only given this a minute or two. I probably could have given it longer. Uh, take the edge of a knife or the handle of a spoon or something and just go around the outside edge to free it up. But let's see if it's going to drop out. Oop, it did, but not intact. I left some of it inside, but that's no problem because I'll get the rest of that out with a spoon. I wanted to see if it was burnt on the bottom. But just the same, there you can see what I've got, a hot steaming muffin that did break in two, but that was just my fault for being in a rush to get it out. Maybe I didn't oil it enough on the bottom. Uh, give me a second, I'm gonna find a spoon and see if we can't get the rest of that out because what I'm really curious is, did it burn on the bottom? All right, I'm back with a spoon, let's see. And no, it didn't. That was just my impatience. I'm gonna put it in the, oh yeah. No, it's coming out very easy. I'm gonna put it in the, in the bowl with the bottom facing up so that you can see. The color, because it's just spot on. You can see it didn't really stick in the bottom. No more than a muffin pan would anywhere else. Now let's see if I can tip this down. Down here, that's the, oh, there. There, that's the browning that occurred on the bottom of the cat pot. All right, let's give this one a try. And it is hot. And it is good. Man, that's a good recipe. Hmm. But it's hot. Ah, okay. So, couple of closing comments and thoughts on baking, simple trail baking. I hope you uh, learned something from this video. I showed two very simple variations on baking with kit that you likely already have, a pot and a cup. Uh, most of us carry, at least most of us bushcrafters tend to carry stainless steel pots and stainless steel cups. That's all you really need, just some spacer. You gotta have some spacer in the bottom, but only if you're doing the dry baking. If you're doing the wet baking, you don't need the spacer. As you saw, the wet baking took almost half the time. It rose higher. It just didn't brown top or bottom. So if browning's important to you, then dry baking is the way to go. If the browning isn't all that important to you, then go with the wet baking because it just seems easier all the way around. That, that would be my recommendations. Okay, so again, very simple. With quick kit that I already had, something I would have likely have had with me, I just dug into my food bag, got my muffin mix out, or my bannock mix, it's the same thing, and that's what I use for this demonstration, with a few added things, of course. Um, okay, if you have any questions, if you have any suggestions, like what other styles of baking you might like to see, I'll likely come back and do some bannock on a stick. I've done that before, but bannock on a stick, bannock in the ash, called ash cake and any number of variations on that over time. But if you have any suggestions, questions, put them in the comment section below. But while I enjoy the rest of this on this beautiful sunny May afternoon, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.